Wow, what an election. Let's analyze the results. This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and welcome to the Issues Watch podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with my favorite Washington lobbyist, Rob Zucker, a partner at Winning Strategies, and we're going to discuss the congressional elections. Rob's been a guest on this podcast a few times and always provides fascinating insights into political and public policy issues. And he grew up right here in New Jersey, South Orange, so he understands the New Jersey angle. He's got a great sense of what's really happening in Washington. Please note that we are recording this interview on Friday, November 11th, when certain election outcomes are still up in the air. Welcome back, Rob. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. Can you tell our viewers, uh, to start off with, can you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do for a living? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a partner at Winning Strategies Washington, which is a bipartisan uh, federal government affairs and competitive grant writing firm uh, based here in Washington, D.C. I'm a native of South Orange, New Jersey. I worked in the New Jersey congressional delegation and in the Illinois congressional delegation for nine years on Capitol Hill. And uh, December is going to be 19 years at winning strategies for me. Wow. Long time. Yeah. Uh, I think I remember you from when you uh, you worked for Congressman Rothman, right? I did. I was, I was okay. Steve Rothman's uh, legislative director. Correct. Okay. So let's move on to the election. Rob, everyone expected the Republicans to blow the Democrats out of the water. I know I did. But clearly that did not happen. I know there are still some undecided races, but where do things stand right now? Absolutely. And, you know, we're speaking on November 11th on Friday. So uh, this is a snapshot of where things appear to be at the moment. Um, Republicans have won 211 seats in the House of Representatives and Democrats have won 200 seats. Uh, Please remember the 218 seats are needed uh, for a majority or to control the House of Representatives. There there are currently 24 contests that have not yet been called by any of the networks. Um, Some of that's due to incomplete counts um, or uncertainty about the outstanding ballots there. And then maybe just to give a little bit of analysis of that, you know, even before we go a little bit further, of those 24 contests where the outcome isn't yet known, um, the Cook Political Report, which is a nonpartisan, you know, professional elections analysis uh, firm. Um, They regard Democrats as favorites in 10 of those 24 races. They regard Republicans as favorites in eight of those races. And six of those contests are considered too close to call. Most of the outstanding races that we don't yet know the results in, the final results rather, are in California, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. So, I think that for a lot of your audience and, and certainly for um, for the things that I do for a living, I think one of the most important things to understand is that Republicans are more likely to gain the majority than Democrats at this stage of the counting and with the particular seats that remain uh, not yet called. But there's a small but real chance that Democrats could retain the majority. And you're referring to the House. Are both. I'm, I'm, so far, I'm just talking about the House of Representatives. Okay. In terms Got of it. the Senate, um, we don't yet know control of the Senate either. Um, it's actually possible that we might know either later today or over the weekend a uh, critical race in Nevada, which could be determinative. I'll get to that in a moment. But basically where things stand is that Republicans have 49 seats in their column and Democrats have won 49 seats. Um, there are two races one in Nevada and one in Georgia that are where the winner is not yet determined. Um, In Nevada, that's important because they're still counting ballots. And uh, based on that count, if Democrats can gain that seat or rather retain that seat as it's held by uh, Senator uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, they will hit the 50 mark necessary for them to control the chamber. 
In Georgia, we know that there's going to be a runoff on December 6th because neither of the candidates, uh, neither of the top vote getters, either Senator Raphael Warnock for Democrats or Herschel Walker for Republicans, was able to exceed the 50% threshold. Um, there were other parties that garnered very small portions of the vote down in Georgia, and that's going to a runoff that'll be happening on December 6th. Um, and because of the nature of the way that control of the Senate works, if Democrats get 50, they can control it with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, breaking ties. However, Republicans need to win both races to, in order to control that chamber. Right. And just going back for just one second to the Nevada race, which yes. uh, is, is who's who, who does Cook political report? Who are they saying is the more likely to win, the Democrat or the Republican? Um, I'm not sure if Cook has given an assessment. However, there's people on the ground that are close political analysts in Nevada. John Ralston is one of them. Um, others that work for another outfit down here, which is extremely well respected called Inside Elections. And they are looking at where the outstanding ballots lie. Um, okay. And also, by the way, by the methodology that the ballot was cast. For instance, Republicans in Nevada have voted in person in greater percentages than Democrats. Um, the ballots we're talking about now are largely mail-in ballots, which have favored Democrats. We also know the geography. We know that there's two counties that are generally more favorable to Democrats, where there are many more ballots outstanding than the mail-in ballots in the rural counties in Nevada, which are generally considered more favorable to the Republican uh, nominee. Therefore, um, those analysts, even if they're not calling the race, um, the way that those outstanding ballots continue to be counted in batches and the results announced, um, the trends with some of those mail-in ballots in the more populous areas where there's numerically just more ballots to be counted um, are favoring the Democrat, the incumbent, at a clip north of 55, 60, 65 percent in some cases. If Catherine Cortez Masto continues to receive results like that, um, with where the ballots are and with how those ballots are cast, that's how analysts can make a more reliable projection of who will win. Doesn't mean that all of the votes will be counted within the next 24, 48, 72 hours. Most of them will be, but you can start to have a more reliable sense of when all the ballots are actually counted based on those trends um, that the Democrats more likely than the Republican to prevail. Okay, so if she wins, then the Democrats will be right back uh, in the Senate where they were, and they'll have the majority. And we won't have to wait <laughs> until December 6th to at least know that answer to that question. Um, so tell us, what went right and what went wrong for the Democrats? And then the same question for the Republicans. Well, for Democrats, you know, keeping control of the Senate, if that's, you know, if they appear on that track to do so, would probably be the most prominent thing that they would say they got right. Um, there's just so much at stake within um, the president's agenda, president of the same party, President Biden, obviously, that uh, Republican control of the Senate would be um, a significant impediment. That means, for instance, Supreme Court nominations. If anybody were to leave the Supreme Court. Um, as we saw in 2016, Republicans were not willing to give President Obama even a hearing on, you know, the person that he put up, um, you know, Judge Gorsuch for that opening. So I wonder aloud if Republicans take the Senate, if they would allow a Democrat to try and fill it. Um, so I think that Supreme Court nominations, um, other forms, other nominations are obviously uh, very important. I also think that that with the control of the House likely to swing to Republicans, um, being able to have an entity or a, or a group of senators other than just the president counter, as a counterbalance is important um, because we're going to see a lot of investigations under a Republican House G, uh, majority. We're going to see a lot of narrative that they would be able to drive by nature of being the majority in that chamber. If Democrats can remain the majority, aside from the very practical standpoint of determining what bills come to the floor, that would be a really important counterbalance heading into 2024. I'd also say that, and, and, and it's going to sound a little bit of a paradox, 
But just coming close and remaining close in the House is something that went right for Democrats. Um, losing control is a horrible outcome, obviously. Right. And uh, you know the 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 way that the House of Representatives runs is even more majority wins basis. You determine what comes to the floor, and typically, if you bring something to the floor, you can muscle it through. If you're in the majority in the House of Representatives, but losing it narrowly is a much better outcome right. than some of the alternatives. Um, not the least of which is because it's going to make it harder for the majority Republicans, if that proves to be the case to maneuver and to operate the place. Um, and then secondarily, it just represents a much smaller gap that's needed to retake control potentially in 2024. And I think, you know, we know from history that that's a pretty good outcome. You know, in 36 of the 39 midterm elections since the Civil War, the president's party has lost seats and Democrats at least mathematically might not um, if they were able to somehow, you know, keep a slender majority. But even so, if they lose it in the Senate, where 19 of 26 midterm elections saw the party in power lose seats, they're bucking that trend, it looks like. Yeah, that is something. I don't think, uh, well, I don't go all the way back to the 1800s. So I've never seen a, a race where the midterms and the president's party uh, won. But um, so now let's look at the Republicans. Well, actually, I mean, Go ahead. I, I didn't get to—I didn't get to say what went wrong for Democrats. I think oh, that's, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I will admit, I, I work at a bipartisan firm. You know, we, we work great among ourselves, but even as a Democrat, I have to talk about a little bit what didn't go right. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think we're going to look back on this cycle and say that you know redistricting in New York State was just one of the biggest things that went awry. Um, you know, Democrats control the legislature in New York. In fact, they control the Senate in the state legislature, if I understand it, for the first time during a decennial redistricting in, in like 100 years or longer. And so they, by having the legislature and having the governorship and not having the redistricting go right, um, because it was the maps that they, they wrote were overturned by courts, giving Republicans in New York much more favorable lines than they otherwise uh, may have had to run on. Um, I think that's going to prove to be one of the things that we say went most wrong for Democrats. You know, even just with two or three more seats, we might find that that could have been the difference between a majority for Democrats in the House of Representatives uh, and, and being in the minority. And, and when I say two or three more seats, to be clear, that's two or more three, three seats just from New York. Um, wow. And then, you know, bigger picture, you know, maybe it's symbolic. I'd say... Um, Senate Democrats are going to regret their inability to unseat incumbent Ron Johnson. Um, Ron Johnson is a senator that has played down the severity of the January 6th insurrection. Um, he has uh, been very, remained very close with President Trump or talking about things in a very similar manner. Uh, casting doubt on our election system and its reliability and, and, and even the validity of the 2020 elections. So I think that on a night where Democrats were reelecting a, a governor in Wisconsin, but failing to defeat Ron Johnson, I think that that's probably something that we can safely say didn't go right for them. Now looking at the Republicans? Redistricting went right. I mean, in contrast to the states where Democrats are in control, um, Republicans were able to pull all the levers in the legislature in places like Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio, and, 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 and write themselves favorable maps that withstood court scrutiny or that courts refused to, to set aside, at least right now, in North Carolina. Actually, the determination the courts made is that rewrite it, but after the cycle. But um, uh, you know, I think that that will prove to be one of the things that went right the most. We might see redistricting responsible almost entirely at the low range of what Republican gains might be in the House, we might see redistricting be almost entirely responsible for determining control. So I think, I think in that sense, um, winning the majority, even if it's by a narrow amount, and redistricting were huge assets uh, to Republicans and, 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 and remarkable wins. And what um, did they do wrong? <laughs> Um, well, I think there. I think you know. Uh, uh, I think there's a lot of introspection among Republicans 
and among conservatives about that right now because expectations had been set so high. So I think there's a few things here. It doesn't mean that things went more wrong for Republicans than Democrats. It's just there's probably a few more things to observe. I'd say that failure to capture the Senate is a, is a huge letdown, um, considering especially what was perceived as the vulnerability of several Democratic incumbents running for re-election, uh, including those in states like New Hampshire, where I think Republicans had sincerely high hopes. Um, Pennsylvania, obviously, is a place. And I think in Pennsylvania, it really, for me, also talks about what went wrong in terms of candidate quality. Um, and that's combined as well with the effect that and the sway that Trump continues to control over the Republican Party. Um, that also, I would say, includes doubling down on election denial for many of the, the people that were running in these seats. But in Pennsylvania, where Dr. Mehmet Oz was selected on the strength of an endorsement by President Trump, and where uh, there, was a, there was a much more open primary, including people, I think a, a, a very wealthy former you know, venture capital executive was in the running, people who had won a statewide office previously. They would have been more bland choices perhaps for Pennsylvanians. Um, but they wouldn't have been as polarizing. And I think that I think there's that's a letdown or something that went wrong in Pennsylvania, by the way, I guess you can consider it going doubly wrong because that was a seat that Republicans previously held. Um, and I think that another example of that is Arizona, where it looks like that um, Senator Mark Kelly, um, who was appointed to the seat and is likely to 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 prevail in his reelection now, um, I think we're going to see that as uh, a place where, a more moderate or maybe a less sensational candidate than Blake Masters, um, you know, would have been able to pull it out. Um, and I think that another way of just recognizing it, um, uh, quant excuse me, quantifying the why these are disappointments for Republicans in the House in some of these other midterm sweep elections, like we saw in 1994, um, we saw 54 seats be gained by Republicans in the middle of President Clinton's first term. In 2010, in the middle of President Obama's first term, there was a gain of 63 seats. Now, those were off much higher, uh, Republicans had much lower uh, floors that they were starting with, so they had more numbers to gain to begin with. But I think that you can get a sense where this cycle may net Republicans as few as four seats, and maybe as many as 14. It, it, just the magnitude uh, of it, uh, I think, is going to be a disappointment. So. What do you think were the key issues and political dynamics? Uh, the economy, crime, abortion, uh, the, the personal roles of Trump or Biden, uh, or any baggage or not baggage that they brought with them. So what do you see as the key, the key dynamics? I think it's fair to say that the economy um, and especially inflation um, hurt Democrats. Um, it's a very difficult environment in which they yeah. were running. Uh, and and as is more likely that we will see, there's a chance that they lost a substantial number of seats and control of the House. So I think that those headwinds, um, the headwinds of a president with a, you know, approval ratings in the low 40s, those were, were difficult dynamics when you think about um, the landscape on which these races were run and won by Republicans. Um, at the same time, I think it's it's pretty clear that the Dobbs decision um, overturning Roe v. Wade and abortion were potent issues for Democrats that they rallied around and mobilized. There were places like Michigan and elsewhere that um, you know the right to you know your your, your freedom of choice when it comes to uh, reproductive health was enshrined in the in the state constitution or alternately in a place like Kentucky where we didn't see any races turn on this, but we know that a constitutional amendment that would have favored the, the, the anti-abortion side of things failed by I think 6535. I think wow. it's pretty undeniable that, that abortion was a issue around which Democrats were able to mobilize. And I think that considering like we did a few minutes ago, the historical trend of midterm elections for the party in power, I, I just would have to think that that's, that's pretty clear. Um, I think Trump also, uh, you know, undeniably was a factor. 
And I can get into that a little bit more if you want to hear about it. Yeah, sure. Um, let us know if you think uh, it helped or hurt the Republicans, really particularly in swing races where, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans were seen as uh, equal contenders. So I'm not really interested in, uh, you know, some state out and wherever that's, you know, 80 percent Republican. Again, trying to look at historic trends and then maybe how they differ, they were different this time around. Right. Um, I think that the, the again, outfits like Cook Political Report, Inside Elections, these are nonpartisan firms. You know, they thought there were a couple of dozen toss up races and typically toss ups break toward one party or the other. But at this point, they're running um, for the party in power towards Democrats um, by about a two to one margin. And I, I could be on that strength that I think we can know that, you know, with the economic headwinds that we're seeing, you know, with some of the other presidential approval rating, that there's significant trends that are being bucked, even as Democrats are losing the House. I think that's attributable to Trump. Um, I think that another way of thinking of that and why I think it's attributable to Trump is, you know, we work with our clients to prepare for elections and transitions in, in a pretty good level of detail. Um, so they're ready for any contingency, for instance. So in looking at it, I don't think we were able to identify, at least in modern history, another former president that was as active in the two years after they left office as Trump was, you know, right. and, and that's for lots of reasons. I mean, you know, the way he left office with, with the, you know, casting doubt on the elections in 2020, kept him in the, kept him in the press. Fanning the flames of the January 6th insurrection kept him in the press. Um, the, the, the platforms, him using social media and otherwise to continue to criticize and remain a part of the public debate, um, I think is a differentiator and the, the extent to which he was then investigated both on Capitol Hill for those actions related to January 6th, as well as, uh, prosecutions that are moving forward in places like Georgia and New York, they kept him in the press and in the public attention in ways that I just don't really see, you know, you know, comparisons for. And, you know, often I think that midterm elections are considered um, referendums on the performance of the person who's in the White House. And, and you know, here, I think one of the reasons that we can explain the relatively good outcome for the party in the White House is that there was another player in the other party who made themselves a factor that voters had to take into account or were responding to when casting their ballots in 2022. So do you think everything you just spoke about there, do you think what happened and the Republicans doing uh, worse than expected and many Republican pundits themselves sort of at least intimating that it's partly Donald Trump's fault, do you see him maintaining his uh, position as the strongest force in the Republican Party, or do you think there'll be some kind of revolt, or where do we go from here? Any, what are people saying or thinking? Well, I think he's on a weaker footing. Um, I'm not sure if that will matter uh, necessarily, though, and that's something that I think Republicans are going to be struggling with to, to understand over this next year, year and a half, as they look to, to choose a standard bearer for the 2024 presidential race. I mean, President Trump still remains um, popular among Republicans, and the intensity of the way that Republican supporters feel for him, I'm not sure I've seen a comparable dynamic, um, you know, in the now, you know, 27 years I've been around politics. I think the ardor and the and the strength by which they believe in President Trump is, is really quite remarkable. At the same time, I think that there are a number of Republicans, whether they're yet um, a big enough block within that party, I, I, I don't know. But there's a number of Republicans that obviously look at the way that um, President Trump got involved and what that meant for candidate quality or the issues that that were important in races, like debating whether or not the 20, like relitigating something that the courts found no evidence of, relitigating the validity of the 2020 elections was a rallying cry in any number of Republican races this year. Um, and I think that's something that there's a number of Republicans don't want to see happen heading into 2024. I think there's a number of Republicans that look at the way Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, won his reelection handily, uh, you know, really going away 
and they see that there's other voices, other people who could pick up the flag and run with it that wouldn't have the same baggage as Trump. Um, and I think that, you know, under 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 Trump in 2018, uh, Republicans lost the House of Representatives. With him being as active as he was in running for election in 2020, they lost control of the Senate. We now have midterm elections, which are unexpectedly good for Democrats and for the party in power. I think there's a lot of Republicans that would like to turn the page because they otherwise believe that voters would listen to their message um, and respond to it by, by casting votes for Republicans uh, in an election. And we just haven't seen them do that in the same way this cycle. Right. OK, so um, looking at, you know, the kind of issues that CPAs and the business community are interested in, again, assuming that the Republicans take at least one of the two houses, do you see and maybe it's impossible to do this now, but do you see any uh, what kind of an impact it might have on taxation and business issues, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in New Jersey? I mean, look, we're going to start seeing the end of the 10 year window on those Trump tax cuts, you know, or even 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 smaller time frames for some of the provisions in it. Um, you know, I was struck the other day when I saw that there's there was a change that actually went into place this year on the way that depreciation uh, or expensing rather is done over a five year time period instead of immediately on certain investments by businesses and um industry was basically asking the Democratic Congress, even before the end of this year, to try and address um, what they would see as drawbacks in the 2017 Trump tax cuts. To me, that was really interesting because obviously no Democrats supported the 27 Trump tax cuts, but Democrats were being asked to fix it. Um, I think we're gonna, it, it's gonna be fascinating, um, but I don't think that there, I wouldn't see a signal or the stage being set for any large scale overhauls or detente on tax issues. Um, I do think that there's a whole range of things we usually call down here in Washington tax extenders that mm. will remain in play for, no, for, for, for bipartisan consensus to be found, but nothing in the way of one party prevailing entirely over the other party. Okay, got it. Um, in New Jersey, looking at uh, our home state, the Democrats lost only one seat in the House contest, leaving them with a still large majority of nine to three. They also took Menendez won his reelection on the Senate side. But do these results, do you think they reflect the national mood or dynamics particular to New Jersey? I think I think they can be a combination of both. Um, I think that uh, there was redistricting in New Jersey. And um, the, with the lines being redrawn, one of those seats that was lost by Democrats, which is where Congressman Malinowski sits in the seventh district and where he was defeated by Tom Kane Jr. Um, I think that that, uh, that contest uh, can be attributed to the rewriting of the lines um, as well as aspects of a national mood. I mean, I think that under the old lines, Congressman Malinowski says that he would have been reelected. And I think that um, he's obviously expert in knowing the actual, you know, on the ground impact in his own district. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I think that there were places that incumbents, even after their, their district receiving more votes, excuse me, uh, more favorable lines for Democrats, like Congressman Gottheimer, um, you know, I think that in a bad cycle um, where he would have had more Republicans previously, that would have been a little more tenuous uh, perhaps. And he was able to, to win re-election working very hard on his own re-election, but rather comfortably. Um, but I think that what it probably also another takeaway is that these members are, are gonna be here for a while. You know, some of those, you know, three members, obviously one just losing, uh, Congressman Malinowski, but Congressman Kim in the third district and Congressman right. Cheryl in the 11th district. Uh, both, you know, rising stars in different aspects of the Democratic Party. Um, I think that that if you know winning this cycle meant you know a lot towards consolidating their ability to remain in Washington for a longer period of time. Um, so I think that's that's really important to understand. 
I think you touched on briefly, although I think it's in the House of Representatives, we did have the departure of Congressman Albio Ceres with his retirement, and Rob Menendez Jr. was elected to succeed him because no Senate seats were up for election this cycle. But so even though um, only one uh, only one seat changed hands, we're going to see two new members of the New Jersey congressional delegation. Right. Okay. Well, some new faces. So, Rob, that uh, about wraps it up for this episode. And as always, thank you so much for joining us again. And we look forward to having you another time. Thanks, Rob. You're very welcome. And I'd love to come back. So thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for listening and watching. And be sure to support the New Jersey CPA Political Action Committee, the only nonpartisan group in New Jersey dedicated solely to fighting for CPAs in the legislative arena. Learn more and contribute at njcpa.org slash PAC.